So welcome, everybody. I hate to interrupt your table conversation. Looks like you're having so much fun there. Um, but I hope to offer something, not me, but my guest. I hope to offer something that will compensate for the interruption. Um, so uh, my name is John Lutz. I uh, work in the History Department at the University of Victoria. And it's my pleasure to be the host of Café Historique this year. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're all meeting on the homeland, the territory of the Songhees and Esquimalt people whose uh, relationship to this land continues to this day. And as I think, if, if you're a regular Cafe Historique, I, I often say that, uh, you know, I used to feel uh, awkward about making these territorial acknowledgments because um, sometimes they just seem empty. Um, but uh, over the years, uh, I've started myself to develop a relationship with the Songhees and Esquimalt people. I do some historical research work with, uh, with them. Um, our department has started offering territorial tours. Uh, to colleagues at the university, and um, in other ways, we've been working with them, and so it feels like, like we're, 
at least we're trying to make some small contribution to reconciliation. So when, when, uh, so maybe I just encourage all of you to think about if there's a, just a small way that you can think about making some kind of, um, um, and even if it's talking to a neighbor who seems to have some outdated ideas or 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 whatever. It, 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 anyway, just saying for me, it feels more comfortable to make a territorial acknowledgement if I'm if I'm actually making some effort to to change the world. Um, I don't know if there's a there's a beautiful uh, um, skit from. Um, uh, on YouTube from, uh, what is it, uh, uh, the, 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 the Baroness Von Sketch? Anybody ever see Baroness Von Sketch? Yeah. Have you ever seen their kind of territorial acknowledgments uh, skit? Uh, you know, somebody gets up and says, uh, well, uh, well, uh, well, I'd like to acknowledge we're meeting on the territory of the so-and-so people, and, and, uh, and, and that's all they say. And then somebody on it says, well, should we all get up and leave? And, uh, and, 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 and uh, anyway, you've got to watch it, but it's, it's really good, and it kind of, kind of focuses the attention on, well, well, we should do something if we're making a territorial acknowledgement. So um, that's enough of that. I'm, um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Beatrice de Alba Coach, uh, uh, whose name you see up there, who is a colleague in the History Department at the University of Victoria. Beatrice was born in Mexico. She um, studied, did her bachelor's degree in Mexico. I'm not exactly sure where in Mexico. Exactly. Uh, I was going to say that. And um, with exactly that same accent, too. And um, then she uh, uh, did some graduate studies in France, in Paris, at uh, Queen's in Canada, and uh, went on to do her PhD in Princeton. So uh, uh, no slouch uh, in getting herself uh, through a PhD in Princeton. Um, and she's taught elsewhere before she came to uh, UVic and, and now is a colleague in the History Department at the University of Victoria. And she is the founding director of the Latin American Studies Program and also a Latin American Studies Group. Latin American Research Group. Um, she uh, studies and is an expert in uh, kind of early intellectual and cl uh, early colonial and, um, and early uh, national period of uh, Latin America. She also studies kind of global culture in that same kind of uh, uh, 18th century, late 17th century, 18th century era. And she's going to speak to us today on a day that shook the world, uh, August 13th, 13, 1521. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Co the, the Alba Coach. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks, John, uh, for that warm welcome. Uh, so this is where lecturing and uh, stand-up comedian intersects. So <laughs> let's uh, and I, I, you know, I think I have a little bit more experience on the lecturing part than on the standing comedian. But who knows? It's just very unusual for me not to see faces when I when I teach. It's really what I. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, counting on. So today we're going to talk about uh, a very important date that, as John was saying, uh, it shook a world, and we're going to talk about how how is it that it came to be, whose world was shook, and and how this all unraveled. But the first image, which was also used for uh, advertising the event, is. Um, the title is The Conquest of Mexico by Cortes. And that's not what I'm going to talk about, because that was the fall of Tenochtitlan is not the conquest of Mexico. It's just the first step. It's just the fall of a city. And the main point we're going to see, it was not by Cortes. I mean, he was there. Okay. Of course he was there. But if we start, what I'm going to start doing is to um, deconstruct this kind of narrative uh, visual narrative and uh, textual narratives that uh, starting with around the you know, mid 17th century in Spain, Antonio de Solis, start writing uh, stories in which uh, they are really going to emphasize the protagonism of Cortes. And this image is particularly interesting. You see tons of men in steel, very few indigenous, and they are taking the city by storm. But that's not really what happened. So what happened? All right, so this is the first uh, view that the Europeans had of the city that fell uh, in August 13, 1521. This is Tenochtitlan, and it appears uh, as part of the publication, uh, in now a translation in Latin, originally from the Spanish publication of the letters of Hernán Cortés. Hernán Cortés is writing to Charles V, in medias res, in the middle of the event, he, f he dates his letter 1520. Uh, so the city has not fallen, and yet he is still 
he's, he's at that moment reporting uh, to the, the emperor about what is happening and uh, the world that he is trying to bring as new subjects uh, for the emperor. But one thing that strikes us is precisely the location of the city. It's, it's natural environment in a, a lake that appears round, but it's not round, as we will see, it's actually five lakes, but an amazing city with causeways and built on the lake was uh, real often referred to as the Venice of the Americas. Truly, uh, um, really an uh, engineering of marvels uh, that the, uh, the Aztecs were able to, um, to accomplish. Okay, so, can we move on? So our protagonists, as we normally understand this event, involve Hernán Cortés, and when he went back to Spain, he was there on a, several of, of occasions after the fall of Tenochtitlan. On this occasion, 1529, so several years after the fall, and he's lobbying for obtaining more of the things he, he wanted to obtain when he embarked on this, and, and, he, and he actually did become a, a Marquis of the Valley of Oaxaca, a Grandee of Spain, one of the most wealthiest men uh, in Spain. And um, at the time, Christophe Vides is at court in Madrid, and we have then a, a, a portrait of what Hernán Cortés looked like as a, a youngish man of 44. Moctezuma, we don't have any pictorial records at the time. Some post-conquest, one pretty uh, uh, shortly after, do give us some image of him. But this one, again, from the mid 17th century, portrays him as you know the, the the tragic hero, right? The man who lost his empire. In fact, the man who gave his empire, translatio imperi, he trans just gave the transfer of power to Hernán Cortés. So Hernán Cortés said in his letters, and why, we don't think it really happened that way. All right, um, so let's start at what was this city that fell? So let's start by moving things a little bit back in time to see the Valley of, of Mexico, the Basin of Mexico. We have there what uh, Tenochtitlan looked like presumably, in uh, 1325. This is the year when the city is founded. And uh, you still have it there today, Mexico City. It might strike you that those avenues that are so uh, clearly uh, visible from an aerial uh, photography is, uh, are based really on the causeways that the Mexica had established. And there's still main thoroughfare, Tacuba, Iztapalapa, th that's, it's part of Mexico City. So one point that we're starting to see here is fall of Tenochtitlan, well, maybe continuity, right? Transformation from Tenochtitlan into Mexico City. All right, but to give you an idea then of the entourage, the, the, um, the, the environment, uh, we can see in this map here uh, that actually um, Tenochtitlan is on the, the lake, there's an X there, uh, and you see it on a lake called Lake Texcoco. That's a salty lake. The, the lakes that had good drinking water and were really uh, the basis for the agriculture uh, uh, that sustained a very large population. Tenochtitlan was a city of more than 20,000 inhabitants, so it's very large. Um, and this, uh, um, these two lakes, uh, Xochimilco and Chalco, were really central. So this is important too because the city on a lake surrounded by salted water, needs fresh water. And then there's other two lakes uh, on the top, Sumpango and the other lake there that uh, are important uh, because at one point, uh, Hernán Cortés embarks out of Texcoco to the, to the right, but when he flees, has to go all around the lake and further back. We'll get to other maps, but just this gives you an idea of the space. Okay, we talk about Aztec Empire, but if we want to be a little bit more precise, it's actually a triple alliance. These were three main cities uh, that I've mentioned right now, Texcoco, which is the one over here to the right, uh, Tlacopan uh, to, to your left, and then at the center, Tenochtitlan, which became the dominant, most important city of this triple alliance. The city was founded according to, to the uh, ancient beliefs from these people, uh, these Aztecs, because they came from a, p a place in the north 
Aztlan, we don't really know where, where Aztlan is, perhaps somewhere in present day United States, and they migrated all the way down to the basin of Mexico until they found what their tutelar god, Huichilopochtli, told them they would be able to, find, to see, and it was a, a stone on which was growing a cactus, and it had an eagle. Then the eagle was eating a serpent. That appeared a bit later on. But the stone with the cactus, that is the foundational spot. So when they saw that, and they saw that in the island of uh, where Tenochtitlan was found, this is where it all started. And we see the importance of this representation uh, of the, the, the city, the site, with that glyph of the stone and, and the eagle, actually it's a caracara, but that's okay. Uh, in, uh, in codices, uh, some are very uh, made shortly after, after the fall of Tenochtitlan. Mendoza is the first viceroy. All right, so let's talk about that empire, that Aztec empire, the empire of Motecozuma. Uh, we see it's a coast-to-coast -coast empire from the Gulf of Mexico to the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, it uh, really holds on to that center, central part of, of Mexico. That's all the pink area. But we also see a little, the, the, the hole in the donut, right? There's an area there in, in uh, light colored, and that is the area of Tlaxcala, the Tlaxcalan, and it's very important to remember that these individuals were not of Tlaxcala, uh, were in constant uh, war with the, the, the Mexica, those of Mexico City, or uh, later Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, Mexicas. Um, they, the Triple Alliance was not able to subjugate Tlaxcala, but it kept uh, the city of Tlaxcala, that's actually a confederation of, of four um, lords and their, their, no, their nobility and possessions, they were surrounded by the Triple Alliance and there was constant warfare. So they're bitter, bitter enemies and there they are in the center of this empire. All right. What, does the cap what did the capital look like? Here's a, I, I like this rendition because it's at dusk, and this is the, you know, it's kind of like a scary, imposing view here. This is the central precinct of Tenochtitlan. It's an area uh, on the water, uh, s uh, uh, which is, is walled, not, not anyone and everyone could get in there. This is the religious administrative center. Uh, it's the heart uh, of the empire. You've got a very imposing, tall temple with two little sanctuaries at the top. Those sanctuaries were for the a god of, of war, Wichilopochtli, the tutelar god, and Tlaloc, the god of, of rain. And then you have the skull racks in front, gladiatorial circle, um, administrative buildings, palaces, multiple palaces for, for, the, for the nobility, the Calmecac, the school for education of men and women. Uh, so this is, this is the city, and if the city is going to fall, this has to come down, right? Note that it's paved, it's important, especially when you're riding a horse. Okay, so here we have a little bit closer view, this, this uh, maquette with Templo Mayor. It was um, uh, constructed in the standard Mesoamerican style, and also uh, we see this in, in South America, of uh, mounting one, uh, re the, the new aspect, the refurbished and enlarged aspect of a pyramid on top of the older pyramid. So there's about seven different um, manifestations of the Templo Mayor inaugurated in 1487. All right, and now we have the precinct more towards the back of this image. The lake is more clearly viewed there. And I want to point your attention to the causeways. So these are the, the axis point for this uh, center of, of, of the city, but you can see that there's some drawbridges, right? So that has, was very astutely constructed in such a way that the access by foot could be controlled. At the same time, we see that there's uh, the possibility of maneuvering in the water, and in fact, um, it, for this, this culture, it was porters uh, that carried everything that needed to be transported, as well as canoes. So using the waterway was very important, and they could really move a lot uh, in, in their canoes. But also close to us, uh, at the bottom of this image, we see agricultural area. 
And that is really an amazement, not the city is an amazement from the point of view that where it's constructed, but also amazing is the agricultural uh, fields, the floating gardens called chinampas that allowed the, um, the Tenochcas, the, the Aztecs, to sustain their large population. So here we see them uh, working uh, in, in the fields. And the way these fields work, it's really amazing. They are going to use the very rich soil from the lake, so that's uh, uh, full of nutrients, using stakes and willows to construct kind of pens if you want, fill it in with, uh, with uh, good topsoil, and there with the willows providing shade and very moist and rich soil, they could have crops year round. So the, the standard trilogy of corn, squash, beans, chiles, you know, um, other herbs, there's a lot of, um, of, of, um, of birds, of fowl, there's fish. So, uh, and they, they had dogs, they had turkey. Uh, it's a, a rich diet that was available to, um, to, the, to the Aztecs. Today, if you uh, visit uh, Mexico City, you can still see glimpses of this in uh, Xochimilco, uh, where now mainly it's dedicated to the production of flowers. And you can have a little promenade there. Okay, um, so. What, what happened? Um, I, I'm going to avail myself of uh, images coming from codices that were produced shortly after the fall of Tenochtitlan by indigenous and mestizo informants, painters, scribes. So um, uh, this is a, a bit of a, of a different perspective than we normally have from a very European Spanish uh, view, right? Or the view of, if you ever read Prescott, you know, then you get that uh, uh, North American translation of it. We see here the, um, the Spaniards disembarking on the coast of Veracruz. So their first uh, um, moment to really make uh, their way inland. But it might uh, catch your attention that we see a female figure right there uh, towards the, the right uh, of the image. And this uh, uh, figure, this historical figure, Malinalin Malinsin, baptized as Doña Marina, uh, will actually be central. So this is a narrative that has a lot more to do with uh, female contribution than we normally tend to think. So here is, here is this, uh, this codex, Florentine Codex, uh, the book 12s, multiple books. It's about everything, all the culture of, of um, pre-contact Aztec world compiled by a Franciscan friar with his indigenous aides. And it's a proto-anthropological work because there was an organization of uh, three different sites with the elders all answering questionnaires about what the culture was like and then compiling them, providing pictorial, Nahuatl, and Spanish version of everything, including then what happened. So the what happened is book 12. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So I was mentioning that this, this figure, Malinali Malinsen Doña Marina, is, is central. Uh, we'll see where she joins uh, the forces of, of Cortes at what point. I, I will get to that. But I also um, want to bring to, to, to your attention another important source of information from the perspective of those folks the Tlaxcalans, and that, the donut hole that I was talking about, uh, in the center of, of the Aztec Empire that were quite uh, unhappy with the, uh, the, the, um, the Aztecs, but that sought to join forces, and more than join forces, actually pretty much allowed for the Tenochtitlan to fall because they wanted to have a different uh, situation, you know, position themselves better in a change of order. So uh, the figure of, of Doña Marina then appears here in what's called the, the Lienzo de Tlaxcala. Um, and this is also shortly after uh, the fall of Tenochtitlan. And it's one of the most comprehensive documents, not just about how Tla, uh, Tenochtitlan fell, but really what the conquest was like. The fall of Tenochtitlan is the beginning of the conquest, and the Tlaxcalans are going to be the allies, not of Cortes here, but of the viceroys and the authorities of the Spanish crown pushing their domains further north, further south, all the way to the Philippines, which had 
troops from Tlaxcala. Okay, and Malintzin appears as, you know, in t TV series, et cetera, as we still have it. So let's talk a little bit about the nitty gritty of, of this expedition of Cortes. On the screen, we have three different attempts. So um, Hispaniola is already, and, and Cuba are already under the control of the Spaniards, and they know about riches and have these fantastic ideas of riches uh, inland. So there are several attempts uh, in successive years, 1517, 1518, 1519. The first two fail. They attempt to enter via the Yucatan, where you have a very different ethnic group, the Maya. And the Maya resisted ferociously. And it was not possible to have any kind of agreement or any, any uh, possibility of m going in through uh, that part. So Cortes, then, is the third expedition of 1519. So we're talking about a fall in 1521. Expedition starts in 1519. So it's a protracted um, affair. And in, in Yucatan, he stops, he picks up uh, a shipwrecked Spaniard who helps a bit as a translator, but he only knew Maya and, uh, and Spanish, of course. He'd been there shipwrecked for close to a decade. Uh, and then when we have Pontonchan, and I've put that in, in a kind of a greeny yellow um, square, in that city, which is still Maya uh, terrain, uh, there, uh, there's, again, as always, the Spaniards were arrived, there's a bit of a confrontation. Usually the indigenous would give them water, food, something, you know, go away. That was a, you either fight or you, you go away. And in this go away and leave us alone, uh, Cortes receives 20 women. These are slave women, sla young slave women, including the figure that we already saw, Malintzin. She is uh, given to one of the captains, Puerto Carrero. By the time they get to Veracruz, so um, uh, right there on the coast, Sempoala is in green, they realize that this young girl, she's a teen, could, st could speak the language, not of the Totonacs, but of some of the folks in that area that were subjects to the Aztec that speak Nahuatl, and that she could manage Nahuatl and new Maya. So then suddenly she has become an amazing figure because she's able to communicate. Immediately Cortes takes uh, control of, of uh, uh, Malintzin. Uh, she, uh, Puerto Carrero was sent to, to Spain on a certain mission and, uh, and she will demonstrate her um, ability to, to translate and to contribute to the campaign in, a, in really important ways. So now, with the help of, of uh, Malintzin and some uh, folks already supporting from Sempoala, they're moving inland, and they're going to move to Tlaxcala and finally Tenochtitlan. All right, so let's take a closer look with this map. So here we see, it because I, it's important to kind of get a sense when we get to the fall of distances of, of places. So we he have here in blue Tlaxcala. And that, as, as mentioned, is the site of the main allies of uh, the Spaniards. But we also see, I put an arrow, the city of Texcoco, which I mentioned was part of the Triple Alliance, eventually will change sides and become also very interested in supporting the Spaniards. In fact, the reconstruction of Tenochtitlan will be on the efforts of the nobility of Texcoco. There's uh, Tenochtitlan in the center, but as we have this map here, the reason why I'm pointing to Texcoco is that once the Spaniards arrive, so I'm gonna go, uh, go a bit ahead, but I'll come back. They arrive into Tenochtitlan, they're received, but then there's a massacre and they're, they're kicked out. When they're kicked out, the Spaniards have to go around all the lakes to Tlaxcala in a different terrain to lick their wounds, literally. Hernán Cortés lost three fingers. Um, and from Tlaxcala, they will build 13 Bergantines by the Tlaxcalans. They will be carried to Texcoco. They will build a canal, and they will launch the sea, what would became the siege of so that gives you an idea just of the terrain. Okay, 
So we have here, again, uh, a bit more of visuals of what's happening. We come back to the lienzo de Tlaxcala, uh, and we see, again, for the, the, the pictorial understanding from the perspective of the Tlaxcalans, from the, from the indigenous perspective, the most central figure here is Doña Marina. It's Malin Singh, because she's doing the translation between Cortes, he's dismounted, and the four lords of Tlaxcala. Without the help of these four lords, the whole event would not have happened. These four lords became so central that, of course, the Spanish crown will recompense them, not as much as they wanted. Coats of arms, uh, they could ride horses, have swords, and definitely claim their autonomy as much as possible. And so we see them depicted later in the, in the 17th century uh, as a combination of both uh, indigenous uh, nobility because of their crown with the with the feathers, but very much also like uh, European nobility. So it is very much what what they were. They were a part of the diversity of the nobles that are part of the Spanish Empire. Okay, so here is the moment. So we're finally going to get into Tenochtitlan before we're, the, the Spaniards are kicked out. So here's another codex, Codex Axcatitlan. It shows us. Um, the arrival, uh, 8 November 1519, so Cortes and his allies are arriving, and we already see, but in a, only in the category of porters, we see indigenous figures. So this is only a partial view of their, of their contribution because mainly they are going to contribute as warriors, but also as, as uh, a, a many and many other factors. And interestingly, we see as if leading <laughs> the whole campaign. We see Ma Malin seen, but the thing is that we're lacking the next page of the codex in which we would have seen the whole entourage of Moctezuma and she would have been there as she did with the nobles of Tlaxcala to translate and uh, have the interaction flow between the Spaniards and, and the local lords. But we don't have that page and so we now have a kind of a rendition that puts Malin in, in a different light. What happened there? So they arrive, and, and Moctezuma uh, welcomes welcome the Spaniards uh, in a strange m event that uh, there's many debates as exactly how this happened, and it's uh, somewhat perplexing, is that <clears throat> the Spaniards, without much force, simply apprehend Moctezuma and make him his prisoner. He still rules, but he's got someone who's now controlling him. So uh, Cortes reports, what I, as, as mentioned, that, that Moctezuma simply gave him uh, power. Okay, I know that, and he invents the story, based on some aspects of uh, indigenous tradition, that the, uh, the folks in Tenochtitlan would one day be subjugated from folks coming from the east. So later on, it was constructed that there was all these omens and Moctezuma simply allowed fate to happen. I don't know. In any case, uh, they're having some time there, you know, months are going by, and we arrive to a cr crucial moment. We, uh, they arrive in November, but now we have the celebration of the Toshkatl um, ceremony, and it becomes a massacre. And it's this point that's really going to trigger things. Things are going to get really ugly, as they usually do in massacres. What, what's happening here, very quickly, um, I didn't mention that Hernán Cortés is a rebel. Uh, why he's writing to the emperor is because he's disobeyed the man who sent him, who's the governor of Cuba. He thought, I don't want to have anything to do with the governor of Cuba. I am financing half of, the, of, of this expedition once I get to, to the mainland. I'm sinking my ships, he didn't burn them, uh, and I'm taking control. But when that was learned, in people learn about this, in, uh, in especially the, the governor, uh, learned about this in, in Cuba, he sends an expedition, Pamphilo de Narvaez and men, et cetera, to apprehend Cortes. When they arrive to the coast of Veracruz, Cortes goes out to meet him and leaves Pedro de Alvarado, one of his brash uh, captains, in charge of Tenochtitlan. Mokte Koshuma had asked for permission to have this ceremony on the day of 27th May, and they agreed. But 
The Spaniards were told, were afraid, it was going to be an ambush, uh, they're nervous, and Alvarado and the Spaniards simply kill everyone in the precincts that we saw. They were the nobility, uh, and many of them were unarmed, and it's, it's a, a huge disaster. Cortes arrives a few days after that. Uh, um, by June uh, 29, just like a few days before that, he's, he's defeated Narvaez. Now he has more men, uh, and they all march into Tenochtitlan to find an extremely tense city. Moctezuma is not able to pacify anybody. Well, how could you? Because they've just kind of slaughtered all your elite. And he is, he's killed um, shortly thereafter. Another aspect that is not well um, known exactly who killed him, did the Spaniards kill him? Did his own people stone him? Did they stone him and the Spaniards finish him off? We don't know. But in any case, uh, he, he dies uh, on uh, 29 June. And the next day, there is that real push and pretty much succeeded in expelling the Spaniards from uh, from Tenochtitlan. The, from the Spaniards' perspective, it's called La Noche Triste, so the, the, the night of sorrows, but it's certainly a day to rejoice uh, from the perspective of, of the Tenochtitlas. In the Liencho de Tlaxcala, so the two images on the top come from the Sagún Florentine Codex, uh, the, the massacre there, uh, and, and the death of, of, of Moctezuma. Uh, but the one in the bottom uh, part there is from Tlaxcala, and there again we see uh, something that is new. We see the confrontation of indigenous warriors. In fact, we see at the front of the charge an indigenous warrior followed by Marina, followed by the Spaniards. So the order is very different as who is taking the lead, and that is very much uh, characteristic of the Liencho de Tlaxcala. They are claiming for, for themselves what they uh, actually contributed to, to happening. And on the top, we see um, um, a small ship, uh, and it's uh, taking uh, some of the nobility, some of the, the sons and daughters of, of Moctezuma, some of them uh, survived, others died, uh, fleeing and, and taking them th with them as they leave the city. All right, so, so as mentioned, this, uh, after this catastrophe from the perspective of the Spaniards and good moment from the perspective of, of the Tenochtitlas, the Spaniards uh, go back to their allies, uh, to the, the main spot where their allies are, Tlaxcala, and it's at that point that uh, Cortes sits down to write his, his letters. He says it starts with, I am building 13 Bergantines. So I know now how the city works, and I have to take the city initially by the water. But it can't only be a naval uh, attack, but it's certainly very important to, to have control over the lake. So who participated? Let's take a look at some at some figures. So uh, under the, the orders of, of, uh, of Cortes, less than 1% of the people involved are Spaniards. More than 99% are the indigenous allies. They are initially then, from the Spanish perspective, 700 foot soldiers, 118 crossbow and harquebusier, and 86 horsemen. It's not a lot, frankly. And from the indigenous, here's how it happens. I mean, if that's all you got, you're not going to be there too long. So how is it that that small group of Spaniards can take down that amazing city? Well, because 25,000 warriors from Tlaxcala sign on, uh, 30,000 warriors from Huejotzingo, Cholula, and Chalco signed on, and 20,000 warriors from Coyoacán signed on, in addition to, and very important, porters, laborers, because those causeways that we saw, the Tenochtitlas would expand them, and the, the, the laborers of the Allies of Cortes had to you know, fill them up so that they could use the horses and they could use the men and all the warriors to charge. So there's a lot of engineering going on. Uh, yeah, it took three months. So they have time to build and destroy and rebuild. And everyone eats. 
So a, a big part of this is that this enormous amount of people involved in this campaign need food prepared. So the preparation of food is, as customary and vast majority of societies, is the role of women. And so these women were also part of the ally um, um, forces. So let's see, the siege then starts on April 28, 1521. And we have some images here. Again, we've got an image from Tlaxcala, uh, and then three images from, from the Lienzo de Tlaxcala, and three images from the Florentine Codex. There's an image here in the Florentine Codex that is very interesting because it's not much mentioned in other sources, but we do know that it, it actually happened, which is smallpox. So, and smallpox is, is it's, it's a good thing to maybe take a moment and talk about it. At times people said, oh, well, it was biological warfare, and so the Spaniards brought, brought the disease. To, no, they, well, they did bring it, but they didn't bring it intentionally. And those who first died were their own allies. One of the four lords of Tlaxcala, Jicotencatl, died of smallpox. So it's going to, it's affecting, smallpox uh, was affecting everybody. In, in the Americas, and it hit Tenochtitlan at the time that uh, Cortes and his allies have left, have gone back to Tlaxcala, and it, then it, it spreads at that point. So some of, the, some of the important leaders, such as the successor of Moctezuma, Cuitlahuac, dies of smallpox, and then uh, command is taken over by the next emperor and last, which is Cuauhtémoc, uh, but the decrease, uh, the, the drop in population, which was significant, uh, indeed that was the, the case in, in, in Mesoamerica, uh, it happens in other uh, moments of the, of the disease and other disease spreading in the 1540s and 1560s. So that collapse of the population is not happening at the time of the siege, but it is a factor. You know, it's definitely when your emperor dies of smallpox, it's a factor, you know. Okay, so uh, here we have, uh, again, with, um, with the um, Florentine Codex, uh, emphasis then on the, 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 the Burgantines, the 13 Burgantines built by the Spaniards. They would carry uh, their crossbow, um, men with the crossbows, uh, a gun. But if they open terrain, what followed and really took the, the brunt of the, of the attack were the thousands of canoes of the indigenous allies, which isn't, or isn't always portrayed, right? Um, and again, on this uh, bottom image, uh, where we have, as you might note, that glyph of the stone with the cactus, we know it's Tenochtitlan, uh, and the causeways, ultimately, the, 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 the siege by water was important, Particular when, particularly when the source of fresh water is cut off and the source of food is cut off because the access to the, the island is difficult. But to take over that precinct, it had to be done by foot and with some horses. Uh, so th those causeways were constructed and, and deconstructed along, along the way. It, the city then falls on uh, August 13, 1521, uh, there were several attempts of Cortes to establish uh, uh, the rendition of Cuauhtémoc. He's a young guy, he's not even 20. I, you know, no one who's an emperor at 20 is gonna, is gonna give up, right? So he is not giving up the city, which is a, a big cost for, for his own people, but it makes him into a huge hero. So what happened? The city falls, and what starts? New Spain. New Spain cannot start until this city com collapses and now has to be rebuilt and a new order is established. So on the top mar uh, map, you see the uh, maximum, uh, um, nope, sorry, that's me keeping track of time, uh, maximum uh, claimed lands for uh, New Spain, which would include us here at some point, uh, but that didn't mean that the Spaniards, uh, via its viceroyalty of New Spain, obviously didn't control as much land, but we do see the Philippines, and we see something that <clears throat> is quite important to keep in mind, a bit of the simultaneity of events, that while Tenochtitlan is falling, that same year, Magellan arrives to the Philippines. 
And it is that connection of trans-oceanic connections and eventually the discovery of the route back through the through the, the, North, the North Pacific, but it has, will allow the Spaniards who are competing with the Portuguese for the control of commerce to have their own route from Manila to Mexico, from Mexico to Seville, while the, the Portuguese will go around the, the, the coast of, of, of Africa, establish the Estado da India, and go all the way to Macau. And both of them attempt Japan and both fail. Uh, so it's the, now the Iberian powers have created that first global culture. It's the beginning of it, right? And we see Tenochtitlan is central. Meanwhile, for us, back in Tenochtitlan, the city has to be rebuilt. Cortes did not think, let's build the new capital elsewhere. Says the capital is going to be here. And he built it right there with the same stones. And again, here the Texcocans, the Ixlisotchitl family is really central in the construction because you needed warriors and laborers. Well, you need a lot of laborers now to bring up that city. This is Mexico City today, and that, um, uh, see, that shot allows us to see where the main temple, the Templo Mayor, Tlaloc, and Huichilopochtli, uh, would have stood. But we also see cathedral and national palace. And that, of course, is our, uh, the museum that you can now visit. It's the same city in the sense that I've put an arrow there. This is uh, way into the viceregal period, of the, you know, really 1695, depiction of the main uh, square, La Plaza Mayor, and we see those canals, right? You see the, really the canals and the bridges. So that was still active, so the same way of using the water to have access to the central area. There's a continuity. So there's the National Palace that was Viceregal Palace till 1821, and National Palace to this day. You know. And for Mexico, both uh, not the Viceroyal uh, flag at the top, very clearly that, but all other flags of Mexico as of Mexico became independent as an empire, second empire, and republic, and restored republic, and the present constitutional flag, clearly we see that the nation brings its point of departure and the founding of Tenochtitlan. You know, and that is, the, that is a symbol that we saw from the Mendoza Codex. National heroes. So this, the fall of Tenochtitlan is a, a, the creation of a transoceanic culture, but it is the beginning, of course, of New Spain, but eventually of what Mexico is. So by the time Mexico's independence, 1887 here, Second Republic, uh, restored, Porfiriato is starting, and we have the uh, glorification of that young last Aztec emperor, Cuauhtémoc, in the a main avenue, Paseo de la Reforma, um, that connects Chapultepec to uh, the main, the Zócalo, the main square, Plaza Mayor. And the muralists, now post-revolutionary uh, Mexico, went back and thought when they were commissioned to create art in public buildings. Uh, and they went and thought, the, the art that we're going to uh, put here on these walls, on these frescoes, is going to be the history of Mexico. And in San Ildefonso, which was at one point the Jesuit uh, institution of higher education, right there in the central area of Mexico City, Jose Clemente Orozco, one of the three main muralists, depicts the foundational couple of the nation. Hernán Cortés and Doña Marina. He calls it La Malinche. You know, they are there because Mexico it is a, a nation in which 80 to 85 percent of the population is indigenous or part indigenous. And so this mestizaje of Mexico is, uh, you know, points to that, that initial, initial couple. Diego Rivera, another uh, muralist that, you know, perhaps perhaps more famous because he was married to Frida Kahlo. That was the main point. Anyway, so, so, uh, so Diego Rivera, uh, uh, depicting the National Palace of murals, always the starting point is that fall of Tenochtitlan. So that's what he offers us here. He's pa painting 2935. But if you go to Tlaxcala, you're going to see a different view of the history. It's also public art. It's also, this is the, the governor's palace in, in Tlaxcala. And, and Desiderio Hernández José Tiotzin paints a different version. He paints the Tlaxcalteca version in which those 
flags, and you see there's some men on horse with flags. Well, yeah, it's Hernán Cortés in the center. And the other four, you guessed it, the four lords of Tlaxcala. And at the top, with this eagle, there's many little coat of arms. Those are all the cities that were established with Tlaxcaltecas as conquerors and settlers. I recognize Bustamante, Nuevo León. I'm from Monterrey, Nuevo León. It's like, yeah, Bustamante, that's right. Saltillo, yeah, that's right. These, these are towns in the north of Mexico. And the, the Spaniards arrive with Tlaxcalteca settlers. Okay, so, but it is a troubling moment in the history of Mexico, of course it is. And so we, st we have Jorge Gonzalez Camarena, another later muralist, and he offers us uh, two, two paintings, the fusion of two cultures, very different view from the one in which I started, right? Here's Hernán Cortés, you know, like, no, he's not, these Spaniards aren't having a good time. Or this one called the embrace, you know, what an embrace, right? It's a violent moment. All right, but let's move to something less, less traumatizing. Okay, what, what creates the glue for, for Mexican culture, whether you're a Catholic or not, whether you believe or not, as um, one of the great thinkers himself, Nahua, uh, from uh, 19th century Mexico, Ignacio Manuel Altamirano, as he said, todo mexicano es guadalupano. All Mexican follows the version of Guadalupe. How does she come into play? She's painted by an indigenous uh, artist, Marcos Ipac Aquino, that if he had royalties, or every time this image is reproduced, his family would be so wealthy. But because this is attributed to God, he ain't getting anything. Uh, and <laughs> so there you go, God gets it all. Uh, and so here we have this depiction of a dark Madonna. You know, this is the version of Guadalupe. She appears miraculously. 10 years after the fall of Tenochtitlan, in the sight of the worship of a, in, a female goddess, and it becomes a great site of pilgrimage. Becomes and continues. Here are the pilgrims that year to year, since time immemorial, <laughs> have gone to Tepeyac. Tepeyac is in the north of Mexico City. You might note the dancers. They might look a little bit different than your standard pilgrims going to Santiago de Compostela in Spain, for example, right? They quite don't look the same. Clearly, the adoration of the Virgin of Guadalupe has indigenous pre-contact roots. And they are really uh, um, performed the, the devotion to the Virgin of Guadalupe very much in in a pre-contact way, or maybe mestizo because the guy's wearing a shirt and well, whatever. But the main idea is that there is a continuity. So here's Tepeyac that has had so many people come that there's several different uh, expansions of the basilica. Uh, and then the 1976 one is where the, the, the painting that I, we just saw uh, hangs. But we see that every year for the Feast of the Virgin of Guadalupe, uh, December 12th, Average six million pilgrims will make their way across across the nation to um, you know uh, sing the mañanitas to the Virgin. That's that's the thing that they do. But note again that this is a traditional way of honoring that figure. Again, we go back to a female figure, uh, Malin Singh Guadalupe. They seem to be you know, a, a, a p different. Uh, roles played by women, but the, the women that give cohesion, if you wish, to this nation. So this is my last slide. Uh, it's a very nationalistic place, the, the Tepeyac, the basilica with a huge flag that we all know now about, about the, uh, the shield, and, and there she is. And if you visit it there, it's like the airport. You, you gotta move across because it'll, it'll, it's a conveyor belt. Can't stay too long, <laughs> so the next person can come by. Anyway, so this is what happened. This is the fall of Tenochtitlan, but it's also the beginning of a new society. So thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Beatrice. That was uh, amazing and, um, and uh, helps explain a lot about, uh, to me, a lot about Mexico. Um, I, I'm going to open the floor for questions, but before I do, I forgot to mention that uh, um, 
that uh, as a kind of a volunteer, group of volunteers, uh, we like to pay a little bit to uh, Herman's for use of their space. And so we have a little uh, donation, I think it's a jar, donation jar that we're passing around. So if you haven't seen the donation jar just yet, um, it's passing around the room. Has anybody got the donation jar anywhere near them? Somewhere over there? All right, over in the back there. So uh, it, has it been around the front here? Yes, it has. Has it been over there? Oh, all right, everybody, thank you so much. Um, so um, uh, with that commercial advertisement in the middle, uh, just uh, open the floor for questions. I think you can probably field them, uh, Beatrice. Absolutely, okay? yeah. Um, just try to, to see hands or... Oh, I see, yes. Have you written any books or articles? Because I find your writing, and I'm just so fascinated. I didn't know any of this, and you presented it in such a beautiful way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, have I written? I have uh, on, on, this, on this particular topic. I do touch it uh, by the, what I consider the first modern historian of the conquest of Mexico. I did publish it in English. Uh, and this is a, a, a Jesuit, Francisco Javier Clavijero, who writes the uh, an ancient history of Mexico. And he provides the first most balanced account. Because what we know today is actually based on something more than just Hernán Cortés or his foot soldier, Bernal Díaz del Castillo. The integration of indigenous sources and Spanish sources was first done by, by Clavijero. So I have written on him. Yeah, yeah. that's so. fascinating. And it's under your name? Yep. It's, um, I, I can give you the long, long name. But uh, University of Toronto Press. It's a, it's a chapter on the Jesuit accounts of the Americas. Oh, so yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yes, yeah, okay, I'm kind of blinded here. Yeah, two part question. Yeah. First part, is the Reforma a former canal in Mexico City? Okay, um, no, but there was, a, there was an aqueduct. So, Paseo de la Reforma uh, connects the hill of Chapultepec, which uh, was a nice forested area, to, uh, to the central core, the, the Plaza Mayor. It, it, it's, it wasn't a canal. Paseo de la Reforma was designed, you know, when uh, Hausmann redid uh, Paris and he did L'Etoile and, you know, sort of tore down a lot of old, old buildings in Paris and made the big avenues. Well, and Mexico was very Frenchified at the time. And we had um, uh, uh, Maximilian of Habsburg. And so they redesigned part of the city. And initially it was going to be El Paseo de la Emperatriz. So the, the, um, the, uh, the promenade of the empress. But then when the, you know, Maximilian was shot, nah, that's hap happened to him. And, and Benito Juarez, you know, uh, who is, who is a, a Zapotec, as our first indigenous president, uh, when he restored the republic, they decided this ain't gonna be for any empress. This is going to be for the heroes of the war of reform. The reform with separation of church and state in Mexico happens quite early, 1858. And so that's how it was designed. And so now Cuauhtémoc is in the center there. Second part. Okay. Is, uh, <laughs> why is Chapultepec Park where it is? There was there something about that there that made, that made it stand out. So, okay, so it's, it's about Chapultepec. So the question is, why is Chapultepec where it is, uh, right? Yes. Uh, well, Chapultepec is, is a, a, a little bit of a little hill. It's a natural part of the, of the landscape. Uh, it had springs of water. So there was an aqueduct that connected, you know, for fresh water into, into Tenochtitlan. But at one point it was, you know, like a separate little little uh, settlement, except that with now it's all part of the same. Uh, Chapultepec then became the, um, the site for, indeed, uh, Mexico's first um, military college. Uh, it was also a, a castle, so it was, it was supposed to be the emperor's sort of um, uh, secondary residence, if you didn't want to be in the national or vice regal palace. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's its site, and it's re represented by a cricket. That's Chapultepec. Um, oh, we have other questions. Thank you, because I, oh, yes, thanks, yes. The images that you showed there were obviously not, who are the artists that produced those images circa 1520 and that sort of thing? 
so for the codices, uh, the, so the artists, um, for the lienzo de Tlaxcala, uh, we don't really know exactly who they were. What we do know is that they were um, indigenous painters, that the tradition of painted books of codices on, on a paper made out of a, a bark, uh, amate, that was an old tradition in the Mesoamerican world uh, of the Basin of Mexico. The Mesoamerican world of the Maya used glyphs on stone. But in the central of, of Mexico, there was a tradition, tlaquilos is what they were called, but to know the exact name that we know that this was the work of Tlaquilo XYZ, unfortunately not. And in fact, the original Liencio de Tlaxcala is now lost. And what we have are copies of copies of copies. For the, the, um, the Florentine Codex, we have more information of who they were. Um, not necessarily the painters. Again, they... They, their names are, have been lost, which is a pity, uh, but we do have the aides of Sagún, and we do have um, their, their, their names, uh, Martin Jacobita, amongst, amongst others, uh, Antonio Valeriano. They all have very Hispanic names, you know, but they are in indigenous, um, first-generation uh, nobles, first-generation after contact. Some of them uh, indigenous, some of them mestizos, and trained... Uh, in, in the world of the Spaniards in Latin, uh, obviously in Spanish, but maintaining their knowledge of Nahuatl. And then there, was, there were painters and scribes. The exact name of them, we don't know. Yeah. But, but we do know that, of that tradition. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes? What was the conflict between the four different indigenous groups that they couldn't jump to, to an alliance to yeah. fight off the you know, when we look at it, we think, gosh, they could have gotten a clue. But <laughs> they didn't because they didn't, uh, they didn't see themselves in that way. I mean, the, the notion of a kind of um, indigenous brotherhood, if you want, was not really what was on the ground. There were long-standing rivalries. Um, the Aztec Empire was a kind of I mean, some historians don't want to call it an empire, but anyway, some say, yeah, it was an empire. So it was warfare, dominate an area, extract tribute. And amongst the tribute that sometimes was extracted, and this is another point of debate, was um, prisoners of war for human sacrifice. And the, day, the feast of, the, of the, what is known as the massacre of the Templo Mayor, uh, often the, the folks that were sacrificed on that occasion came from Tlaxcala. So, you know, that doesn't make you really warm-hearted towards the Tenochcas, and, and it's very hard to see ahead. So they're thinking, we don't like the, the Aztecs, these are some new guys, maybe we're just going to have a new kind of reality without understanding that, because no one knew, that in the establishment of the new society, yes, the indigenous nobility had, had rank and recognition, but not as much as they wanted. The, the, the crown tended to group everyone together, you know, group, group uh, some nobles uh, and then the commoners, and impose a situation of now of exploitation, often very harsh exploitation of the indigenous that was not foreseen. You know, and so that's why when we look back and say, well, come on, you, you had the possibility to do it. And certainly when you look at numbers, think there's, of course, but it's also a matter of, of framework, of, of understanding the moment, right? And of hoping that the new situation might have got folks like the Tlaxcalans and the Texcocanos a better deal than they had. Um, so that's to say, okay, this European here, well, maybe, maybe it'll work for me. Okay. Um, well, I'm seeing more questions. Yes. Are these? Is this filmed tonight? Can we go in and look at it again? Uh, yeah, because, yeah, because if it were filmed, so interesting. Oh, well, thank so you. much information. It is filmed. That's why I can't see you all because of the yeah, cameras. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is filmed. I knew it was live streamed. But <laughs> yeah. You have a, a record of it. It's okay. live streamed and it's available on the Herman's uh, website, okay. um, Herman's YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Thank you.
<laughs> uh, can, can I ask a question? Sure. So um, you, you briefly alluded to Montezuma uh, 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 welcoming uh, Cortez, and, and, and some, uh, some accounts have him, um, uh, Montezuma, thinking of him as a, as a deity or a returning mm -hmm. deity. And uh, I, I wonder um, to what credence you give that, but also uh, what about the Tenochtans and others? Did they think of Cortez as uh, bringing, uh, as with supernatural alliances or, or not? Um, so, so it's interesting, like who's who's the god here, right? Because <laughs> on the on the one hand, there there, and sometimes a lot was is is done, maybe more in popular culture of um, the 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 indigenous thought that the Europeans were gods. Well, that lasted like about five seconds, you know, and that their their horses were like wow, and they're together. No, you know, they, the 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 macanas, which were the swords with obsidian blades. Some of these warriors were able to chop the head off of a horse in one blow. Okay, these are just animals, big deer, they call them. And they soon realize these Spaniards, they're not gods. You know, not only do they fall and die and bleed, we've offered them tortillas with some blood. They didn't kind of like that. So they are not gods because, you know, the substance for gods is blood. And if you go, uh, then you're not a god. So there's that's what's a part of it. So very soon, no, 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 they're not. Now, what's interesting here is, is that um, Cortes says, I mean, Cortes, come on. We gotta believe Cortes. If we believe Cortes, Cortes says in his second letter, the one that he's writing while they're building the Burgantines, that when he encounters Moctezuma, Moctezuma says, I know, I know my enemies have told you that my palace is completely full of gold, that I'm just surrounded by gold, and I know they've told you that I am not human, that I'm, I'm a god. And then, says Cortes, very biblically, he lifts his clothes like, you bet, Moctezuma would have did that, and says, see, I'm human. And so what it's alluding to is I'm human, so I'm not a, a god as my enemies say I am. So, the reverence, so there's, what's the kernel of truth here? The reverence uh, given to the, the emperor you know, was really supreme. So the, that, that they were connected uh, to the divinity, somehow embodying the divinity, yes. And that, that is Mesoamerican. In the Maya world, it's the, 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 the kings are shamans and they, trans, they move into other realms often through bloodletting. So there's a tradition that the, the head of state is also a supreme religious leader and has that portal of access to the divine. Then we're into a slippery slope and they're also divine, right? And that, or at least that's what Cortes says that Moctezuma said. Um, so, so the other issue that's important here is there is one uh, god, god, the god, uh, and it's a complicated story, Quetzalcoatl the plumed serpent. Uh, and Teotihuacan, if you ever go to, to Mexico City, you'll visit the, the pyramids in Teotihuacan, the, the, the main temple there in the citadel dedicated to him. Now, post-contact renditions of this god was that he said that he would come back eventually from the east. Later it was added that he was more fair-skinned than the normal folks. Later it was that, okay, right, so we're now conflating a post-contact version that the Spaniards were indeed the representatives of, uh, of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, but that is much, much later, uh, and it's not something that appears with, with Cortes. I, I doubt, you know, that that, that had any, any more credibility, but in the different versions, it, it factors in, right? Yeah. Um, No, we're the same people over here about these lights. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, then I hope you will join me in thanking Dr. Uh, Baker. Well, thank you. For Thanks for your question. Spectacular talk. Thank you, Baker. So I'm pleased to announce that our speaker uh, for next month's uh, um, uh, Day That Shook the World is here, Patrick Lozar. And Patrick is going to be talking. Patrick is going to be talking about. <laughs> 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 we got to get the date here. 
I need glasses and I need notes. Um, 7th of October, 1763. Of course, you all know uh, the significance of that date, but uh, if you don't, then you have to come on, uh, on uh, uh, next one. October 17, 1763. I'll give you a hint because we subtitle the talk. He subtitles the talk. Uh, Rights, Repression, and Resurgence in Indigenous North America. And so um, I hope you'll all join us uh, live. Maybe uh, by then uh, some of the COVID restrictions will have lifted and we'll, have a, we'll be able to have a few more people here. But if not, uh, of course, those of you watching from home will still be able to enjoy that as well. So one more time, thank you, uh, Beatrice, for, uh, for a lovely talk.